Good morning. How's everyone? Yeah? Yeah? Has everyone, is everyone up and going? Has everyone had their coffee? Yeah? <laughs> you can tell I've had mine, right? <laughs> I'm super pumped up for this one. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, we, um, before we get going, I want everybody to know uh, to put in their, their questions, right, in the event app. Um, we would love to get that going during this panel. So make sure you download that. and. Um, we have a great panel for you all today. Um, for those that didn't meet, my name is Eric Jackson. I'm a sports business reporter at Sportico. Um, and right here we have um, Phaedra Knight, former president of the Women's Sports Foundation, an international athlete and Hall of Fame rugby player. We have Bemasola Abudu, um, vice president um, and country head of Nigeria, an MBA. And we have Crystal Hogan, vice president of ticket sales and service at the Los Angeles Clippers. So um, I want to dive right into it, right? We have so much to cover. And um, first, I just want to go into you know, brand engagement. And obviously, you know, it, ar arguably, it's, it's more competitive than ever, right? To not just draw attention, but to maintain it right here in the sports landscape. And I want to ask you all, what are you doing for your brands um, at your organizations or, you know, or personal brands to, to grow that brand, not just nationally, but worldwide? Um, PK, if you can. Um, well, I know with. All of the things I'm doing, and I'll, I'll go through, I'll start with the fact that at the core, I think of all of them, and I think this is something we're all aware of, is you know authenticity, right? Um, that shines through your passion about your brand, yeah. your passion about yeah. what it is, the purpose that you know brings you to the table. Um, so that's a given. Uh, you have to be passionate about it. You have to have roots in it, otherwise, like anything that's unrooted, it will not have any sort of sustainability. Um, so once you've kind of gotten past that with, with the things, whether it's the Women's Sports Foundation when I was president and that role, what we did, um, or if it's with you know Peak Unleashed, which is the, the nonprofit I founded uh, back in uh, 2019, it's, it's really, and, and I think more relevant now is with my clothing brand, um, PSK Collective. Uh, what? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, I had to tap into again what was really what I was really passionate about, and for me it was about putting female athletes in the spotlight because that is obviously something that's very, very much needed. Throughout my rugby career, and I was just having this conversation with you in the green room, right? That um, it, no one in this room probably knows, you know, has ever heard of me before today, right? As a rugby player. Um, and if you did, it's an anomaly. And that's crazy because I was one of the, I'm notably one of the best rugby players in the world. Um, and so that notoriety, right, is very much needed. And so I wanted to create an opportunity a platform for female athletes to gain that notoriety. And so that was really one of the big, biggest burning um, passions behind the PSK Collective, was to bring on rugby players that I actually met, or not rugby players, but athletes that I actually met through my experience in the Women's Sports Foundation, um, and give them another avenue of exposure provide for them an opportunity to build you know, their brand, to put some money in their pocket, um, and just to be a part of that. And so I think that's, you know, just speaking briefly on, on those things, a huge, that was a huge driving force, that authenticity. And then being able to take that and parlay it into a partnership with the Women's Sports Foundation to give back. And so, you know, one of the things, one of the founding things of, of, of PSK Collective is that we will throw back 15% of our net profits to the Women's Sports Foundation. Wow. And so that's, you know, uh, in addition to helping our, our ambassadors. And so I think that authenticity, everything about the brand and what I'm doing, um, it comes from a, the most genuine place in the world. And so for me, that's, that's been my experience in that. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really great question. Um, I say particularly, um, I say for me, because of we just opened the MBA office in Nigeria in February. So a big part of the work I'm doing right now really is how do you grow the brand in Nigeria? How do you gain top of mind awareness? And when you think about Nigeria, I'm not quite sure how familiar everybody here is about Nigeria. Um, number one, I mean, it's the most populous country in Africa. It's the largest economy um, in Africa. When you think of basketball, Nigeria is the mecca of basketball in Africa. I mean, with the NBA and the history of the NBA, you've had about 120 players of Af African heritage playing the NBA. More than half of that have been Nigerians. So it's very interesting because right now, what we're trying to do in Nigeria is how do we get a significant part of the population to love the game of basketball and to develop an affinity um, for the NBA? So how are we doing that? Because of right now, I mean, what the NBA tends to represent globally and what the NBA has done is the NBA is a purveyor of culture. When you're talking about fashion, music, you look at the influence of the NBA, we're doing the same thing in Nigeria, making sure that we're infusing all elements of the local culture in promoting the brand. That means from our fashion, I'm wearing a Nigerian designer as we speak, from our music, your burner boys, your Davidos, to our culture, you know, to food, um, to art, and making sure that all of that is really telling the Nigerian story. And to what you mentioned, being authentic, it's like mm -hmm. telling the African story, telling the Nigerian story. And that's been a big part of what we're doing, that localizing um, the MBA, meaning the MBA represents what it does, but at the same time, how do we infuse all elements of our culture into promoting the brand? So we're doing this in Nigeria, but as a whole, um, with MBA Africa, um, that's a big part of our objective. Another thing that we're doing is um, social justice is a big part of what the, M the MBA's DNA, and no matter what business we do, no matter what country or community we do business in, we look at what are the issues in that community and how can we address that? And if I look at what we're doing in Nigeria, and I would say Nigeria and MBA Africa as a whole, is you're talking about gender equality, right? How are you addressing that um, through our platform? Um, Gender-based violence, youth development. Um, we recently launched what we call Bow For Her, which is a platform that helps um, to really encourage um, women's participation in sports, and how do you ensure that you're creating a safe space for women in sports? So literally, it's doing, I say, taking the same formula the MBA has used in different countries globally, but bringing that to Nigeria and bringing that to Africa and really using our local content and our local culture to push the brand. Crystal? Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I think growth and innovation are large priorities uh, to the league and the NBA is known for taking risks. And, and that's something that really resonates with our chairman, uh, Steve Ballmer. And it's something that we all have taken on uh, with the Clippers all the way from the top, our president, Gillian Zucker, um, throughout an entire organization. And so for us, um, it's really important that we really kind of carry that on. And in my role, um, I'm responsible for relationships with season ticket members. And so that's what our team does. We are every day talking to season ticket members, um, every game, learning from them, listening to them, and making sure we understand what they want and also like what we can do better at. And so in that learning, in that listening, we are making smart changes. And with that, that's how we grow our brand and continue to grow our fan base. Right, is that carried out through a long-term growth plan? Or, you know, and how do you measure that success, right? Is it, you know, is it an increase in season ticket sales or membership or, you know, how do you measure that? What metrics would you, would you look at to, to do that? For us, absolutely. Like, <laughs> results, we are a results-driven organization. And so when you talk about season ticket holders, it's about retention. Mm -hmm. uh, the job of that role is to make sure that you are not sold for one year, but you are a part of the Clippers family, the Clippers culture, and that you come back year after year. That's the success. It's like, mm -hmm. we sell you new one year, but then can we get you to come back? And are we evolving and are we changing enough to make sure that we're staying current and that we're hearing from people um, and that's what we're doing right now. We have a, a new arena coming, uh, opening in uh, fall of 2024. And so we are growing our fan base right now to make sure that our brand is on point and that we are innovating and growing into that new arena and, and that we have that arena full of fans. <laughs> but so how, how do you measure success? Oh, I mean, we're, there's several metrics that we're using to measure success. Number one, I would say fan engagement mm -hmm. um, for the different activations we do in Nigeria. So beginning of the year, 
we did um, the MBA crossover in partnership with Hennessy. Um, I, I suspect people have probably seen floating courts um, show up in different parts of the world. The first floating court was in Nigeria. <laughs> I don't know if y'all have seen so that. I would say that. I'm not sure if you guys have they seen that. They look pretty awesome. Google I don't know it. If the first one was in Nigeria. Yeah. So in terms of activation, the engagement, the sheer voice of conversation um, with sports, I, um, one of the things we're measuring is to see how many people are watching basketball games now, right? Um, subscription of the league pass for the NBA. Um, it's just our events that we're doing. We have... One of the things that we do is, you know, we have the Junior MBA program. We have a, a particular one we've been doing in Nigeria for the past nine years called Power Forward, mm. a program that has reached 150,000 kids in the past nine years in Nigeria. We're expanding that to different parts of the country. So how do we measure success for that? How many kids are we impacting? How many partnerships are we being able to bring, partners are we able to bring on board to buy into what it is that we're doing? So it's, in a certain extent, like, it's a blank slate so it's, you're going from nothing at this point, and so we're measuring it at, at all angles to see how the brand is growing and how people are being receptive. Then I'll probably say finally is to see how basketball becomes a part of the culture. For me, it comes down to when you start hearing your average kid say that I want to grow up, not just to play in the NBA. The NBA launched um, the first league outside of North America in Africa last year called the Basketball Africa League. And the, What's very interesting about the Basketball Africa League is typically majority of the players um, in Nigeria that don't make it to the NBA will play in Europe or will play in the Middle East. But now because of the Basketball Africa League, you have a lot of um, African players that can play in the continent and potentially play for their country. So when you hear the average kid saying, I want to grow up and I want to play in the BAL, I'm like, you know what, we've done something. Once that becomes part of the culture, that's another way in which we're measuring success. Thank you. Um, when it comes to PSK Collective, you know, we measure success by bottom line, right? Sales. <laughs> and, 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 and which retailers are carrying our, our line, you know, in their stores, on their, in their online platforms. Um, but there's more to it than that, right? There's, there's community engagement. We have a big element, like I said, the social justice piece is tied into the brand. Um, and, and so it's, it's, how much are we giving back, right? How much of an impact are we making with, you know, equal pay and and some of the different um, uh, uh, missions of like I said, the Women's Sports Foundation and all the things that they're doing. Um, when it comes to applying that to my MMA career, um, it's kind of the same. It's like wins. Wins equate to. Um, more notoriety. More notoriety equates to a greater brand awareness. So in, in, in building that with, with um, being a fighter, um, it, it ties back into the, the overall brand of PSK, right? Because, and I didn't talk about it earlier, but I, I'm um, in the midst of a MMA career and in pursuit of doing something quite impossible and what most people would probably consider um, insane. Um, <laughs> I think just fighting for most people is insane. But um, you know, I'll turn 48 in less than two weeks, and Woo. my goal is to be a UFC fighter by the time I'm 50. That's incredible. <laughs> you know, so it's you know completing a second elite uh, career. Um, at what is considered dinosaur, uh, I'm considered, you know, really a dinosaur when it comes to that athletic world. But with that, um, it's 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 winning. And if if I continue to win, the brand awareness will take care of itself because it will be a headliner. Um, having to overcome things like ageism, which is r really alive and kicking, and I think people should talk more about it. Um, it is is a part of the social justice piece in this in this story, and so overcoming all of those things will help again build awareness around ageism, around that that, that social justice issue, right? Um, it, but the overall, you know, um, mission, I guess, will be impacted just with success through MMA. Um, but it, it, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the day, it, you know, bottom line, wins, sales, those are the things that are going to keep the lights on and that are going to really kind of make the biggest impact and allow us to continue to do 
what we do. Yeah, numbers don't lie, as they say, right? <laughs> um, I want to ask you all, what strategies have really worked to uh, you know, capture the attention and increase brand engagement for fans, um, of uh, younger fans, you know, Gen Z, as they say, the future is now. And I want to start with you, Crystal, because obviously LA has so many entertainment options and you know, so much to do. And you know, all the teams, including the other NBA team here in Los Angeles. So. <laughs> Oh. Well, I'll mention that. <laughs> uh, no, you're right. There's uh, 12 sports, uh, pro sports teams. There's college sports. There's movies. There's the beach. Mm -hmm. It's everything. Um, one thing that I can say about the Clippers is that we're not trying to be better than anything else. Um, we just want to be the best at being the Clippers. We know who we are. We know what our fans want, and that's our goal. So it's, it's really not a, a competition between those things. It's really kind of working hard to know who we are, um, and that's really what sets us apart amongst everything else here in LA. So for us, a big, um, a big platform we have to utilize and we're utilizing is social media. Um, the internet penetration in Nigeria is one of the highest, actually, in Africa. Um, if you want to reach people, the quickest and fastest way is to make sure that you make content accessible for them on their mobile devices. So from League Pass, making sure that, um, I'll say League Pass offering, and I, I say that because in the US, um, your typical League Pass offering is you being able to subscribe annually. But in Nigeria, Nigeria is a bite-sized economy, all right? Um, with 200 million people, I always say what keeps me up at night is saying, how can I get 10% of that to give me $1 a day, all right? Mm -hmm. So, and what does that mean for the NBA? That means that we're having, we have like um, per day passes and we have per game passes, all right? So making sure that we're making that accessible um, to the population, that's one. Then in terms of content, I mean, music right now in Nigeria is a huge influencer. I mean, a lot of Nigerian artists are not just Nigerian artists anymore. They're now global artists. And one of the things that we're doing is we're getting their buying and getting them to be a part of this. So creating local content with them where they can leverage off um, the MBA's platform, but also us being able to leverage off their platform and the existing credibility they have in the market. So that's the main strategies that we're using right now in Nigeria. Or what we're um, what we're doing with PSK Collective is we're continuing to try to build a, a big social media campaign because our target audience, primary target audience, I must say, because we have a few, um, is Gen Z, and so that's where they. I mean, that's their world, right? Um, and so it's building a bigger social media um, campaign and platform, but it's also kind of going old school and hitting the ground. Um, at some of these, like just a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I hosted a rugby um, a, a rugby tournament for U18s, right? Um, and so getting on the ground, setting up a booth, having presence there, giving out um, apparel at those types of things, that's, that's at the core. I think that will be a core thing um, for us going forward and getting on the ground with other non-traditional sports like lacrosse, um, and field hockey, and obviously trying to work with major sports like basketball, um, like soccer, um, you know, and so forth. But those are those are some pretty um, those are I think some pretty powerful tools for us in terms of generating more engagement, getting more um, exposure. Right, and we've talked so much about the external. I kind of want to talk a little internally, right, um, within the organizations. Um, uh, so I want to ask, you know, how, how important it is, in your opinion, to you know promote an atmosphere of social responsibility and awareness, you know, um, you know, to reach your business goals, right? You know, starting internally before you know going out with a product. I think it goes back to the first question you asked. It's, yeah. it's authenticity. It's so important. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, it's, I am so authentic to a fault. Like, when I don't feel good, you're gonna know it. <laughs> I'm, and I've always been that way. And I've always been criticized when I don't feel good for being moody. Mm -hmm. But it's like, well, I'm being real. Mm -hmm. That's just where I am right now. And if I can communicate that to you, then mm -hmm. why is that a problem? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that culture, that culture that I have, I guess, inherently like, uh, brewed within myself, it's the same kind of culture that we we um, we have with PSK, with my fight team, my coaching staff. It's it's just being real and and aligning with the things that are true to us, and 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 having everyone be on board with the causes that we support. 
You know, it just doesn't make sense if you're not. Um, and we're all wasting our time. And I feel like for the, the, this, I don't know if anybody else in the room can, can relate to this, but when I was, you know, 20 years ago, um, you know, I, I was doing jobs that I was just doing jobs at, right? I was just paying the bills. And one day it's like, I just, it, I woke up and I'm like, why am I doing this? Mm. Like I, I went to law school for four years. I've practiced, or for three years, I practiced law and I'm like, why am I here? Like, what am I doing? This is not me. I'm sitting in a law firm in Chicago doing insurance defense. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> this is a waste of my time and theirs as well, right? And so it's just, it's getting back to doing the things that are true, because that's when you're gonna get the most, and everyone's gonna buy in, and everyone's gonna be an equitable partner in it. Mm -hmm. And when you're working, when you can, create that mentality and culture of people working for themselves because they're so bought in to the mission of the company, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. So for the MBA, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, it's part of the MBA's DNA and I mean, it speaks volume that even before the MBA opened an office in Nigeria from a commercial standpoint, the MBA's history in Nigeria really has been the junior MBA program, which has been focused on how do you make sure that young boys and girls are able to play basketball. But the main objective is not necessarily for talent identification like most people would think, it's how do you use that platform to equip young boys and girls with life skills, life skills that will stay with them for the rest of their life. MBA Africa, last year was when MBA Africa became a standalone entity, but MBA Africa actually opened in 2010. And if you look at the history of MBA Africa, a big part of the work we had been doing before we became um, a standalone entity from a commercial standpoint really has been how do you impact the society we're in. So this is part of the MBA's brand that the buy-in is in there um, internally before we can say we're, um, we're trying to sell that um, externally. And it's, it's in everything that we do. I mean, if you look at Nigeria, we talk about court building. It's, People will say, what's the commercial value in that for you where you want to build courts? But if your mandate is you want to make sure that more boys and girls are playing basketball and they're being equipped with life skills, you need to make sure that no matter what neighborhood a child is from, that they need to have access to a basketball court. So that's a big part of who the NBA is, and it's a big part of everything that we do. Is It's centered around that. But I mean, we are in the business to make money for sure. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say we're not. But it's very important to know that with everything that we do, we put the communities we do business in as the center of everything that we do. Yeah, I would say the Clippers pride themselves in you know being able to use our platform and our resources um, and, and our voice. And and with that, I think it's about empowerment to our employees. Uh, one of the things that we always talk about is being your true authentic self and being able to bring that to work, um, which is led to some really tough conversations, but some open conversations. I think we have employee resource groups. Um, uh, there's also community conversations. And it's really kind of like, what's the cause that is important to you? Being able to have an environment where you're open and able to kind of bring that to your leaders or to our HR group um, and have those conversations conversations and make sure that we're always educating. And, and that's important. So, you know, everybody doesn't have the same cause, but it's really about learning from different people. It's about education. And it's about feeling empowered and comfortable to be able to have those conversations. And that's one of the reasons why I'm proud to work for the organization, because I don't think we hide behind anything. You know, there's yeah. there's not a topic that we are scared to tackle. And we admit that we don't know everything and we're not going to be good at everything and not always get everything right. But it's good that we're always learning. We're always listening and trying and, and allowing our employees to bring those conversations to us and what they want to hear more about. And then in turn, we provide those resources to make sure that we're educating all of our employees. Absolutely, for sure. And uh, you know, you all have such unique perspectives. And as we get on the back end of this panel, I, I kind of want to touch on that a little bit. And um, we can start here with the Crystal. You know, how has being a black woman in a male-dominated industry um, shaped you as a professional? You know, I haven't noticed, right? <laughs> no, I kid. Um, I think representation matters is, is what I'll say. Um, I, I didn't start in the sports industry. I, I started kind of working for a tobacco company and then also a pharmaceutical company before getting into sports. And so when I got into sports, there was uh, one director uh, at the organization that I started with. She was a director of groups. Um, she was married, but her husband lived across the country, and it was like, 
Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so um, as I kind of grew my career, uh, my next boss was a director of service. And so that's what I saw, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a director of service, and I'll you know, just kind of live out my career, have kids, have a family, and be comfortable. I didn't see anything more than that, and I think when I got to the Clippers four years ago, being able to see our team president, uh, Gillian Zucker, really made a difference for me. It's like, wow, I can do that. And she's really kind of turned into a mentor for me. And her, as, long, as well as my bosses, promoted me like, hey, you could do whatever you want. Like, if you want to be a VP, you can be a VP. If you want to be a team president, you can be a team president. So for me, I think it's the responsibility of like being present in this moment and using my platform and my voice and, and showing, hey, that representation matters. So there's other women and people of color um, that see me in this role and, and not settle for mm -hmm. kind of lower level uh, roles or, or what women can do with a family or without family, that's important. And so that's something that you don't see and it's a it's a big responsibility, but um, I take that, I'm, I'm honored to take that and that's what drives me to keep growing. Um, I think also it's not just for women, it's not just for people of color, it's for everyone because I want everyone to understand the importance of having diversity on your team. Um, whether it's a white male or a woman or, or um, any person of color, diversity is important because it's diversity of thought. And your team is going to be so much better because of that. So that's the responsibility um, that I have right now. And, and so that's why I'm here. And then I want to keep talking and keep, you know, preaching that because it does matter. Representation matters. Love that. Ben Michelle? That's a great question. <laughs> so, I mean, the truth is, I always say this whenever, whenever I'm asked this question, that I really don't lead with thinking about myself as a black woman or as my gender. I have to be very honest about that. Mm -hmm. I lead by saying whatever it is I'm doing, I have to be the best at it, better than anybody else. That's, I start from that. But it's not lost on me because when the announcement was made that a woman was the one in charge of like the mecca of basketball in Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know the reaction. I got some messages saying that, oh my gosh, like you must be a very tough woman <laughs> because you have a tall order. But in reality, I mean, I've been in sports for six months now. Um, I've been a huge fan of the game for many, many years. Um, I have always described myself as a super fan of basketball and the NBA. I have a very untraditional um, path to get to the MBA. I mean, I'm known for building brands. That's what I've done for many years from the luxury industry to business aviation, another predominantly male industry. But honestly, um, it, I know it's very important for young women to see, to see that whatever it is they desire is possible, to see someone that looks like them, to see somebody um, just killing it at a, so for me, it really starts with I need to be the best at my job. Um, I'm, I'm very aware that if I don't do well at my job, it's not just Baby Sola did not do well at her job, it's going to reflect on women, it's going to reflect on black women, right? So I'm very aware of that. So, but I tend not to think about that as much, to be very honest, because I know that whatever it is that I do, I always lead with, I have to be, be the best at it. So as long as I'm doing that, I will, um, I will sort of set that path, um, but when, but at the same time, and I say this because like, I mean, I have a foundation where my foundation is focused on how do you equip young women, the next generation of young women with skills and giving them access to resources that will make them have the same opportunities that I've had as well. So I understand the importance of that, but honestly, um, I really, really try not to because I find that whenever I do, it's, I don't wanna say you become overwhelmed by that responsibility, right? or you let, that response, you let that response sometimes become a barrier. Whereas for me, it's just really focusing that wherever I go, I have to be the best at the work that I do. And whether it's being a Nigerian, whether it's being a black woman, just letting people know that I'm in this space and I'm gonna kill it. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I think I've been in, been the only, or one of very few amongst men in my life. I mean, it's just been, story of my life. And so I'm so used to it, right? I'm just, it, it just comes second nature like both of these ladies have just mentioned. And um, I mean, in fighting, especially, I'm the only, I'm the only woman um, that is in my, on my MMA squad, right? Training every day, I'm getting punched by men. 
I'm mm-hmm. getting taken down by men. Um, and so I feel there's a couple of things, right? There's, there's yes, just being the black woman and being um, representing, wearing that badge and representing us, right? And wanting to be the best that I can be. I want to be the most technical. Um, I want to be the most, um, uh, I don't know, the fastest learner because I'm probably one of the most novice ones mm-hmm. in the room as well. And so just being able to like really increase that learning curve and, and being, like you said, being the best that I can be um, on a given day is so critical. Um, and also just being chill, right? Like I'm, I'm old, I'm like old enough to be these guys, mom. <laughs> That's so weird to hear me say that. Like I, I'm someone's mom, right? But you know, and I just don't want I don't want them to have that and get that impression. So I, I, I'm just, just going to be naturally me. And in rugby, I, I want to refer that because that was such a, when I was playing rugby, it was obviously it was very male dominated. And now that I'm in commentating in rugby, it's still the same. So it's in that, it's, it's absolutely knocking it down, knocking it home, like being the best, the, 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 the most authentic, but the most. I don't know, it's different. I don't want to be like Mm -hmm. the other voices that are calling the games, because then what's the point, right? right? So um, it's it's just, again, I I hate to be cliche, but it's just being authentic, going back and being who I am and being true to that. And at the end of the day, I know that that will prevail, so. We have a good amount of veterans here in the crowd, but we also have you know, some younger professionals too. And I just want to ask you all, um, you know, as we wrap up here, what advice would you give to your younger self just you know, as you started out in the business? And if you can just ponder for a minute, you know, breaking in. Um, if you want to start, Crystal. Yeah, two things. Uh, the first thing is, for me, I, and this is kind of something that I've experienced a lot with some younger reps, is what's next, the what's next mentality. Like, I've done a good job, and it's been six months. Where's my next promotion? <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't always work that way. And so um, I always just give the advice, and I think this kind of goes um, to what she was speaking about, is just being the best at your role. Um, can you do it again? Like if you had a good six months, you had a good campaign or had a a good first year, can you replicate that success? Can you do it again? That should be the thought of being the best at any role that you're in. Um, and everything else will work itself out, whether it be promotions or, you know, raises or other opportunities. People see that. Like, you don't have to always wave your hand when you're working hard because people notice that. And it's okay. It's okay to be in a role for more than six months um, and, and not get promoted. I think that's the thing that I, I tell my reps a lot is just hone your skill and your craft. Um, be patient. Do your work work hard and people will notice. Um, And then the other thing I always say is give yourself some grace. I am really, really hard on myself. Mm. Um, I I think just always kind of wanting to to learn fastest and and, and really kind of be the best at everything. And like, I talk to people and I give advice. It's like, oh, you know, you've only been doing this for a short period of time or it's okay and people make mistakes. And the way that I talk to other people is just always encouraging and you can do this and then the way that I talk to myself it's like no this is not okay you can't make mistakes you got to do you got to be the best you got to do and and just giving yourself some grace like looking back on where you come from and how how much you've achieved in that period of time is really important um, because if you if you really look at it and take perspective, I, I I know all of us work really hard, and and giving yourself some grace on that and not being so hard on yourself is really important. So those are my two things of like really being patient, working hard in your career, and allowing your work to speak for yourself, not a timeline. And then second, just giving yourself some grace, being being easy on yourself. Okay, I have four now too. <laughs> <laughs> I said, number one, be known for excellence. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, excellence will open doors for you. It, it's, and it's not about now. It's whatever you find, don't be worried about who the boss you're working for, whether you like the person or not. Just do your best because people notice, people are paying attention, whether you like it or not, they really are. So I always say, be known for that spirit of excellence. That's number one. Number two, stay open to life. Life shocks you. I think sometimes, and like whether new in career or seasoned, 
we all have a tendency to get attached to what we think how life is supposed to play out. And I find that staying open to life has allowed many opportunities to come my way, whether it's working for the MBA. I had a tech company where I was working at a tech company, being happy with my tech company when I got a call about the role, whether it's when I worked for Louis Vuitton, I was looking for a job with the World Bank, and I randomly met the CEO of Louis Vuitton and said, I think you should work for Louis Vuitton. <laughs> so really just staying open to life, and when you do that, life shocks you and surprises you that the outcome is sometimes a lot better than what you expected. Number three, I say be present. We live in a world where we're so obsessed with what's next, right? Even like being present in the moment, right? Whether it's at a job, whether it's at a relationship, learn to just sort of take it and enjoy it and take it for what it is and not be so obsessed with, um, with tomorrow. I, I call it the gift of now, like really just enjoying um, where you are in life and really taking all of that in. And finally, um, I always say everybody's life has a rhythm. Figure out what the rhythm of your life is and pay attention to that. Because in the world we live in, we get obsessed sometimes with what is going on in this person's life or that person's life. But when you have a good sense, and I use the word God because that's how it works in my life, saying so when you have a good sense of how God works in your life or the universe, whichever way you want to look at it, there is a rhythm in your life. And when you, when you, as soon as you can key into that, the more it makes making life decisions easier. Oh, that's powerful. You got me reflecting about my own life right now. <laughs> Good. Um, I think uh, one is breathe, right? Um, I, I'm undoing so many issues now um, in my body uh, through this process, only because I didn't breathe enough and breathe deeply enough. And that, that's, um, that's going to impact so many different things. Obviously, it ties into being present. Um, but it's just the most basic thing we can do to serve ourselves is to breathe deeply and to be present and unplug, put away the phone, right? And just be in the moment because that's when you can see, right? And fighting again, sorry to go back to fighting, but um, when I'm concerned with what this person's gonna throw at me, um, I miss it, right? Or I'm trying to like just punch, but when I'm just breathing, and moving, I see everything. It opens up a world. And so breathing is huge. I think the second thing um, is just be good with failure. Man, I struggle with it so much, right? And it could be failure of losing a game. It could be whatever your interpretation of failure is, right? Like, I mean, it could be, like, I don't know, um, messing up and, 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 and losing something that, you, that means a lot to you because you didn't pay a bill or whatever, right? Like, be, be okay with that failure because it will lead ultimately, if you have your head in the right place and you're looking ahead, it will lead to something quite successful. It will actually add character to your story when you're on a stage one day, you know, and you're, you know, it's successful and you're talking about all the things that weren't successful that got you there. It's so critical. Um, I mean, we won't go into it today. I won't go into it today, but God, there's so many things. If I told you that I've gone through and that I experienced in my life, you know, maybe you've experienced the same. There was a point where I thought, wow, I'm so ashamed of that, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. it's embracing that, again, that's that failure and letting it be a point of transition to success. Um, and so I think those are the two most powerful things that I would probably say to my younger self because they're the bigger themes that have been relevant in my life. Those are three great. Ooh. <laughs> Party foul. Those are three great responses. I love all that. Um, and any questions? I would love to take some. Um, don't be shy, I promise. Anyone? Yeah? <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> No. <laughs> That's a great question. I want to use the word push back um, because this is not unique to the MBA. This happens in every organization where 
you're looking at the dynamic between the headquarters and the regional office, right? And I always say the onus is on the regional office to explain the realities of your market. So for example, in Nigeria, there's certain nuances to the Nigerian market, and it's being able to sort of take the time to explain to the headquarters and let them know that, oh, this is sort of how this works in Nigeria. And the MBA is very flexible. I mean, Nigeria is not the first office um, they have opened outside of, um, outside of the United States. Actually, the office in Lagos is the 14th MBA office. Um, so they're very, very receptive. It's really just taking the time to build that case. I always look at it as the onus falls on us for us to explain to them why this is different from the process that has been established. And they're very receptive to it, yeah. Got another, yeah? Yes. I love that question. I get that question often. <laughs> I think I always, I always tell my boss, um, the CEO of NBA Africa, I'm like, I probably get this question more than anyone else because being a woman. The reality is it will happen eventually. The Basketball Africa League just, we just launched the Basketball Africa League last year. And one thing that is worth noting is that you have different touch points in the, in the pipeline before you get to that point. You have, I mentioned the Junior MBA program, we have the MBA Academy, you have um, the Basketball Without Borders. You have all those things that have been built over the years for men, right? You have to, you can't, you can't jump the process. We have to do exactly the same thing for women as well. And being a woman in this position, I'm, being very vocal about it, but the reality is it's not even a matter of being vocal um, because the MBA understands that this needs to be done. I mean, we buy into it. So it will take time to get there because it's taking us time to have the BAL, but I'm very confident that um, in a couple of years, we will have um, a women's league as well in Africa. But first, we have to make sure we have all those building blocks in place first. If not, it will and it won't. It would not work. So the way the same steps we have taken to build the men's league, we need to take exactly the same steps as well to build the women's league. And I'm very confident that the NBA is invested in doing that. Don't get there. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. I, I would say probably by the time things get to me, it's probably not good. <laughs> if anyone wants to talk to me, then it's not. They're not telling me how great something was. And, and so, with that, is it's really just kind of perspective. Like I get to work in basketball, and and that's really what I think about. I, I it's it's not brain surgery. It's, it's it's not anything terrible. It is it is basketball, and people love it and enjoy it. And so I really kind of take it and give take people kind of where they are and understanding that this is important to them. They've invested their money here and, and they have a level of expectation. And, and also it's really um, something cool that I get to do in my job, especially in my role, to be able to fix that pretty easily. There's nothing that really kind of happens that we can't overcome. And so that's what we talk about with our team. Um, and so knowing that you kind of have that in your back pocket and you're creating this experience with a father and a son or you know a client is coming out and they're really trying to impress someone that we're able to kind of take basketball and use that as a vehicle to to really promote the best experience that they can have especially at a Clippers game it doesn't really bother me I it can be hard um, especially when you hear a lot of the negativity but there are a lot more good days than bad I will say so with that um, it's really easy give some free food some tickets and people are fine <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So how does that relate to your partnership? How do you guys make it flashy, glamorous, and Nigeria? See, Nigerians are Nigerians, all right? We're flashy. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. No, but honestly, and I think this sort of ties to the question she asked earlier, and that's one thing I love about the MBA, honestly, is um, 
the MBA understands what Nigeria represents and be given the liberty that this has to be done the Nigerian way. If you want the buy-in of the Nigerian community, you need this to be done the Nigerian way, which is why, I mean, basketball is very unique and specifically the MBA is very unique in terms of how it has this power to bring everybody together. And it really is like an intersection of all things culture. And for Nigeria, it's very important. I mean, getting the musicians involved, getting the artists involved, um, getting individuals who are influencers um, involved and doing big and, I mean, big production because that's what we do, which is why, I mean, we opened the office in February and everybody said, wow, we did it the Nigerian way, which was we had like a three-day celebration, <laughs> which we had the MBA crossover. We started out with the floating court, which I mentioned earlier, like the first basketball floating court was done in Nigeria. We had Hennessy with our partner, so we did that. Then the second day, we had um, the, um, the office lunch. And we did the Nigerian way, where it was a big, big splash as well, where we had um, a Nigerian musician perform. Then the third day, we had um, a celebrity basketball game on the beach. Then the fourth day, we back to the DNA of the NBA, we donated a basketball court to a community. So it's, I think um, your typical office opening might have been one day celebration, <laughs> <laughs> but it's Nigeria. So I mean, one thing I, like I said, and it's one thing I really love about working for the MBA because they on, the MBA gets that, everyone gets that. And which is why I said that um, for me, it's been, it's been great because you tend to, we have to communicate and we continue to do that to say that for this to work in Nigeria, we have to speak to Nigerians in the language they understand and it is glamorous, it's flashy, that's who we are and that's what the MBA is going to be in Nigeria. I think we have time for one more. Great. Great question. I can start with that. Um, honestly, a big part of that for me is my faith. My faith is very instrumental in who I am. It's what has seen me through um, the best moments in life and the worst moments in life. And um, so I, I start with that. Then secondly, um, with life in general, I see it beyond me. I'm not with the office in Nigeria doing this role and what we're doing with MBA Africa. I don't believe I'm creating this for myself. I'm doing it for my children's children. And I find that when you're doing something, when you see your life's purpose is something bigger than you,